Uh, welcome everyone to today's, uh, today's episode of our Rebel Leadership Series, where we bring you interesting and thought-provoking speakers on the issues that we face at work every day. Uh, delighted that you can all join us, and uh, we have a wonderful speaker lined up for us today, uh, Dave Logan, the author of the phenomenal book, uh, Tribal Leadership, and how you leverage the natural groups within our organizations to take our company to the next level. And uh, he's also a TEDx speaker, uh, professor, and former assistant dean of executive education at the Marshall School of Business, and co-founder and uh, co-founder and partner at Culture Tech uh, Management Consulting Firm that specializes in culture change, strategy, and negotiation. Uh, I'm I'm actually personally very excited to to hear Dave today. I just started reading his book. I haven't finished it yet, but it's it's been a phenomenal read so far, and so I'm just dying to hear what he has to share with us today and how we take our company to the next level. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to our guest for this afternoon, Dave Logan. Welcome aboard. All right, George, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for taking some time out of your day before we head off onto a holiday weekend, those of you in the United States. So first of all, I just want to say the uh, people from Ripple didn't know I was going to say this, but I first met them at a conference uh, probably a year and a half ago and have become real fans of what they do. And I think you'll find that there's a synergy between uh, not just what they offer, but more the philosophy behind their offerings and tribal leadership. So again, thank you for taking some time. Just want to let you know at the very end of the call, uh, I'm going to be making an offer, uh, which I don't normally do, but there's something really interesting happening. You might say the tribal leadership stars are aligning, and there's the opportunity to become involved in a way that has never happened before, and I doubt will ever happen again. So just might stay tuned for that. Okay, so we're going to get started then with the uh, webinar. So again, this is about tribal leadership. Just a few words of background about this. Tribal Leadership is a book, came out in 2008 by Harper Collins, and it has really generated a bit of a movement uh, as people have tried to identify their tribes and their organizations, determine how strong those tribes are. So just one word of vocabulary here at the very beginning. What do I mean by the word tribe? If you look the word up in the dictionary, you'll see that the root of it is Latin. So I'm not talking about Native American tribes or tribes that you would encounter in different parts of Asia or Africa. Uh, that's just not what I mean by the word. Uh, so we define it, my co-authors and I, as a bit of a term of art. So it is a group that is larger than a team and smaller than something else, smaller than most divisions of large companies or smaller than most organizations unless they're, unless they're very young and in the startup stage. So the, the specific definition is a group of between 20 and 150 people. So for those of you that are involved in startups, one of the things that I hope that you will start to think about right now is who are the 20 people who are absolutely committed to the success of your venture. Okay, now those 20 people do not need to be employees. They can be your spouse, they can be investors, they can be early customers or clients if you have them. Uh, as a, someone who taught college for many years, I sit on lots of advisory boards of startup ventures, so I'm a member of those tribes. So you just want to think beyond uh, departmental or divisional or organizational boundaries. You really want to think about those people that are committed to the success of your venture. And if you have less than 20, then you want to get it up to 20. So why is 20 such a magic number? Because at that point, team dynamics fall away and they're really replaced by something more robust and more stable. So a group of 20 tends to form a very strong kind of tribe and that's how we do things around here is according to the rules of that culture. And it did become somewhat rigid. Now you want to set it in the right way so that as it hits that, that magic number of 20, the tribe can do something that it can't do if it doesn't have a more robust culture. So what are we going to do in this session then? We're going to, of course, talk about tribes and how you can lead them. Uh, I've got a couple of very specific uh, objectives here today. The first one is that you will know how to assess your tribe. Okay, you'll, you'll know very specifically what types of tribes you have on a one to five scale and be able to change them. Okay, by the time we're done with the webinar, you will know exactly what actions to take to make your tribes one of the really strong ones in the world as opposed to ones that are merely average. Okay, 75% of tribes dramatically underperform. It dramatically is a word you want to underline and italicize and put in all caps. You'll see exactly how that's uh, accomplished here. So again, the objectives, number one, assess your tribes. And number two, be able to take your tribes one level at a time up to the very highest performing level of culture. 
So what's on your screen right now is one of my favorite quotes by Margaret Mead, and it's become a bit of a cliche. So if you haven't heard this before, you should hear it. If you've heard it before, I'm taking it in a little different direction. But what Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist, said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed people can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And she's absolutely right. A small group of committed people can change the world. That's what uh, startups are about. That's what tribes buried within large companies can accomplish. That's what tribes that are involved in various types of social entrepreneurship or charity work of different kinds can actually unleash upon the world. They can change the world. But notice the, my corollary to that, which is never doubt that a small group of thoughtless, uncommitted people can prevent the world from changing. Indeed, they do so every day. So the question that I'd like to pose to you just rhetorically uh, at this point, we'll look forward to the formal Q&A a bit later, is what is more descriptive of the tribes that you have at work or the tribes that you have socially? Are they the type of tribes that can change the world and, in fact, uh, do so on a regular basis? Or are they the type of tribes that prevent the world from changing? So here's what we found in our research. 75% of tribes are more like Logan's corollary, which is that they prevent the world from being changed. Now, the good news is you can take a tribe and you can modify it. A uh, technical word is transform it, but literally taking it from one form to another, transform, you know, cross forms. So you can make it something much, much stronger than it was before. So that's just the question I'd like you to start thinking about. So we're going to do tribal leadership by the numbers. What I mean by the numbers, so I'm only going to talk about the research here for 20 seconds. You can look at your watch, and I'll be done with it. We'll talk about it again. Here we go. Ready? Start. Okay, this is based on a study, eight and a half years, 24,000 people, and everything I'm going to show you today is the result of that study and of talking about research. I showed an early draft of this to one of my mentors at USC, maybe you may know Warren Bennett, and he looked it over and said, in this very polite, thoughtful, kind of grandfatherly way, I don't care. And what I believe he meant was, I want to read about people. I want to read about the stories of people that are doing these different things, not merely people that are, uh, or not merely statistical tables. So I'm going to paint a bit of a picture here about how these different tribes work. Please remember going into this, we're talking about tribes, we're not talking about individuals, okay? One of your questions I know will be, how does this work? Because it, there are times when it, it'll sound like I'm talking about individuals, and there are times when it's going to sound like I'm talking about something larger, like a group or a tribe. I promise by the time we're done, that this will all get sorted out. But one thing that I always caution people uh, when they start looking at tribal leadership is it is a simple system, but it is not simplistic. Okay, it does not come down to do these four things and great things will happen. Anytime someone tries to sell you a list like that, you want to reach for your wallet because they're trying to get it first. Okay, that's not what this is about. You, you can't check your brain at the door, and this is not for people that want simplistic solutions. I promise we'll sort out all the questions. Please understand there is a little bit of complexity that we have to deal with if we're going to do justice to the subject. So let's start with what my uh, co-authors, John King and Haley Fisher Wright and I describe as a stage one tribe. So here's the deal. Now remember, we're talking about groups, okay, groups of uh, between 20 and 150, but this is their experience. This is what life seems like to them. Okay, now is it really like this? Well, you can debate that but they feel very much alone, right? They feel isolated. They feel alienated from the rest of humankind. Now, when you get enough of these folks together that feel this way, that believe this way, that talk this way, the way they talk is life sucks, life's inherently unfair, you get something like a prison. You get something like a gang. You get something like a terror cell. Now, do we deal with those as employers, as executives, as people who are seeding startups? The answer is, sadly, we do. So I've been teaching uh, executives for a very long time at a bunch of universities, mostly USC, and every once in a while, uh, I'll see a case that someone will write as part of an assignment, and they'll talk about a little bit of accounting fraud. That I, There was this one guy, it was Bob over here, and this one guy, Bob, was stealing money, but it's okay, I got rid of Bob. We called the cops, and they're now facing criminal charges, and I'll often say, are you sure? Because maybe Bob had a couple friends in fact, maybe Bob had more like 19 friends, right? Remember, we're talking about tribes. But in many cases, they'll say, no, 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 it's just Bob. We, we got rid of Bob. Everything's good now. 
and then I'll bump into the person two, three years later, and I'll ask how the business going, and they'll often say, oh, I had no idea. Half the company was an accounting fraud. In fact, the only part of the company that was actually making money was the part that I thought was borderline unprofitable that I was about to shut down. Turns out that was the only part that was actually earning money. So notice that's an example of stage one taking over a company. It does happen, and you got to be aware of it, okay? Now, this type of tribe is only the case 2% of the time in employed situations. Okay, societally, the number's bigger. Don't know what that number is. We collect data in organizations. But in organizations, including governments, nonprofits, and mostly for-profit organizations, since that's what we study, you do see this, but it's rare. Again, 2% of the time. Now, as we go on to stage two, this is a very different kind of discussion that people have. It's not life sucks, but it's my life sucks. So one, if, you, if you've got your driver's license renewed recently, you might be familiar with the kind of culture that I'm talking about, right? We go in and we look at all the people standing around, and, and it seems to take forever for the person to move from point A to point B. How come they're moving so slowly? How come they're not uh, innovating? Why doesn't anyone stand up and lead? And so you can see we're talking about the, the Simpson sisters here. Of course, they're DMV employees in the Simpsons, and then the tagline is sort of wait here. So the theme that you hear from these type of tribes is not life sucks, which is life is inherently unfair. You can't cut a break. That's stage one. Stage two is my life stage, right? I mean, if I got to, you know, hang out with cool people and, and do really fun things in organizations and get paid well, then my life wouldn't, wouldn't suck. But I don't get to do that stuff. So it does. This is the great entrenched mediocrity of corporate America that you also see all around the world. The number that we collected on this prior to the start of the economic downturn was 25%. Remember, we're measuring tribes, not people. So 25% of tribes talk this way in terms of my life sucks. I can't get anything going. So if you were to go into this tribe and say, for example, uh, well, let's, let's stop being mediocre, right? Let's get something going. Let's lead. Let's innovate. Let's find our values. Let's commit to something that's important. Let's start a project or an initiative of some kind that could actually change the world. Go back to Margaret Mead on a small group of you know, committed people can change. Well, come on, let's become that. And the answer would be, no, we tried that once. You know, remember back seven habits of highly effective people. We did that. We did who moved my cheese. That didn't work. Wow, what a waste of time that was. So you just notice the cynicism, the despair, the resignation that just exudes in these tribes. Now, this is why it's so important to focus on tribes, not just individuals. Okay, you can all think, and I can too of people you know or I know that talk this way all the time. There's a good friend of mine who teaches poetry, and every time I talk to her, she tells me how much her life sucks, and then she turns that into a great poem. She, again, she's a, she does poetry, right? But I'm actually not talking about her. I'm talking about a group of people. So imagine what would happen to you if you stopped doing whatever you're doing and you moved in to one of these tribes that talk this way. So one of the principles tribal leadership is tribes are more powerful than any other force in the organization. They're more powerful than the founders, they're more powerful than the board, they're more powerful than the CEO, they're more powerful than all of management put together. Okay, so you wonder why 70% of new strategies or change initiatives fail. It's because, in part, the tribe rejects it, right? So imagine what would happen to your life if you moved into one of these tribes. So the takeaway is tribes are dominant. Okay, so let me just pause here for a moment to do a little bit of housekeeping, which is I know a couple questions are going to come up in people's minds. So one of them is, okay, I got some of this in my organization. I've got some stage two. I, there are people that you're describing perfectly. How do I change them? I mean, what do I do? So first, we need to see the whole map. So we need to see all five types of tribes before we get into how to change them. But just to give you something to think about, go into that tribe just mentally right now and try to find the one person that you can think of in that tribe. So they're a member of the tribe. They complain, they gripe, along with everybody else. But they clearly want things to be different. Now, how do you know they want things to be different? You can tell, or right? listen to your gut. Or maybe they come to you offline and say, I'm tired of this group complaining. They really want things to be different, but they find themselves entrenched in a group that just does not want to do anything other than the minimum to not get fired. 
one more time and we'll move on to stage three. If you've seen the movie Office Space or the TV show The Office, we're talking about stage two, right? But if you think about both of those examples, you also see a boss that behaves very differently. So it's lumber in uh, Office Space and it's Michael Scott, who of just left the show, in The Office. And so how does that person communicate? That person actually communicates according to what we call stage three. Now, this is the top of the mountain in the vast majority of organizations that we study. Top of the mountain. This is how the top executives communicate. This is how the management teams communicate. Remember, this is how boards communicate. We're talking about, again, tribes. So what do people say? I'm great. And in the parenthesis of that, and you're not. So I'm great, and you're not. Now, if you listen to me, you'd be great. If you did what I do, you'd be great. So here we have the picture of the Donald, of course. And if you listen to what Donald says, three most common words are me, I, and mine. Right? It's all about me. Now, what makes stage three function is a blind spot that descends upon tribes when they begin to talk this way. So what you hear from the outside is I, me, mine. I, me, my. I think. Here's what I think. Here's my idea. Here's my suggestion. Here's what I think we can do. So it's an I center tribe. The individuals are very strong. They're usually very accomplished people. They're often very successful. The reason they can fall back to I is because they're used to winning, right? They're used to doing things the right way. Problem is there's no collaboration. There's no building upon what another does. So one of the people we interviewed for the book is uh, Dave Kelly, involved in IDEO, and Dave is a member of two tribes, actually very similar to my own situation. He teaches at Stanford, and he also, of course, is involved in IDEO, very different kinds of tribes. At Stanford, he says, it's like this, like stage three. Everybody's brilliant. They won, they win Nobel Prizes, but there's no innovation in between the silos of the individual. Use another metaphor, it's like a group dental practice. Uh, my dentist is part of a big dental practice, and I've seen my dentist, and he's out of town, I see other dentists, and if you ask any one of them, best dentist. They get really quiet, they'll lean in and they'll say, well, you know, it's me because I graduated from here, been practicing longer, I'm really better at the tough stuff, everybody refers their hard cases to me. So no matter who you talk to, they are the best. And I mentioned the blind spot. So what is that? The blind spot is people don't notice they're talking about themselves. They literally don't hear it. They think they're talking about leadership. They think they're talking about strategy. So when someone says, well, I think the strategy should be X, they actually think they're talking about strategy. But what other people hear is, I think the strategy should be X. So they literally don't hear it. Now, if they heard it, they'd probably stop doing it, right? Because these could be very, for lack of a better word, nauseating tribes. You hear people just talking about themselves over and over and over. One quick story about how this works, it also, should, it also shows the dynamics. So one of the places you see stage three in spades is academia, so since we're doing the list. Some others are law firms, okay, uh, places that do investments, so a lot of investment banking is stage three. Accounting tends to be stage three. Healthcare tends to be stage three. Physician cultures tend to be stage three. Uh, academia tends to be stage three. I mentioned Dave Kelly's example. So here's one from my own uh, background at USC. I joined the full-time faculty at what is now the Marshall School of Business at USC at the time, which is the USC Business School. And I got put in a committee that was looking at quality of work life. And our goal was to make just what it sounds like life better for members of the faculty. So this committee went on, I think it was for about two hours. One person said, well, from my perspective, we need to do a better job of marketing the school. Of course, it's the marketing professor talking. The next person said, well, I think it's really a matter of creating a great culture. You know, my background is organizational behavior. So every person would speak from their own expertise, from their own strength, if you're familiar with the strength movement, strength finder, the Gallup organization, we used to work on that. So it's all good contribution. The problem is the tribal dynamic prevents any of those individual contributions from taking hold because everybody else is making the same sorts of comments. Okay, so this is 48% of tribes. So if you count the numbers so far, stage one is 2%, stage two, says my life sucks is 25%. Now we've got 48% at stage three, hence my statement, 75% of tribes dramatically underperform. Okay, so this is where we are. Most sales organizations, 
are stage three by organizations and talking about tribes. Go to most sales meetings and you hear a lot of I statements. I'm chasing this lead, I'm chasing that lead. If you do nothing but the following in your organization, you will see a dramatic increase in performance. Take your sales group, measure where they are, wherever they are, whether it's two, three, or as we'll get to in a moment, four, and take them to the next level. You'll know how to do that by the time we're done. You do nothing else but upgrade the tribal stage of your sales group, you will likely see a 300 to 500 percent increase in performance. Now, you might be measuring performance as revenue. Expect revenue bumps. It may take a little while to get to the pipeline. If you're measuring new leads, you're measuring uh, perhaps business that's about to close, whatever it is you're measuring, give it a bit of time, but you will see likely a 300 to 500 percent increase. Okay, so that's stage three. So, again, just a moment of housekeeping. What I'm going to do here is just go through stages four and five and then open it up for questions. There's a bit more that has to do with the relationship between individuals and the tribes, but we'll get to that after we take any questions if there are. The, the content here will be divided up into two sections. So, stage, oh, sorry, one more thing about stage three. Um, this is important for some of the stuff later. You see, again, Donald here. The way people communicate at stage three is what's called dyadically. That's D Y A D. The dyad is two people, right? So I'm talking with, uh, let's say, Zach, or I'm talking with George. But I don't actually get George and Zach together. I communicate one on one. So how the Donald communicates here is he tries to convince others that they should do exactly what he wants, and his goal is to make little mini me Donalds. Because we have little stick figures all have Donald heads. Okay, stage four. Now I got to give a shout out. We've got to do USC on the phone. First of all, I have to say fight on. My faculty contract requires me to say that. But here we see a group, right? And you can see that they're all kind of clustered together. You see them leading in together. A little element of a social tribe here. These are the USC colors. And yeah, we do goofy things like this at USC. And you can see again, like, we're great. Okay. So when people say we, and they, and they mean kind of, right, we're great, and they begin to express something about we, what we want, what we stand for, here's kind of a strange question. What do they mean by we? We, uh, we might say, well, he's obviously the tribe, and of course that's true, but what is the we based on, okay? Here's the big misunderstanding. It's not based on kumbaya, okay? It's not based on trust. It's not based on identifying myself as being part of the group. It might look like that, but that's actually not what it is. So what is it? The, the key is, it's in stage four, it's the emergence of shared values. Emergence of shared values. There are values that we hold together, and we know in our gut that we share those values. Now, I realize people on this call have a fairly enlightened view of values. So when I do this, when I do presentations like this in large, established, kind of older companies, I'm not talking about older people, but older companies, there's often a kind of rolling of the eyeballs, right, when you mention shared values. So here's the thing. We just saw the, um, the death of Osama bin Laden. Okay, think about the Navy SEALs that went in and performed that operation, regardless of what you think politically, if we should have done it, or if Pakistan had a right to object. Just put all that to the side. Let's just talk about pure kind of organizational effectiveness. If you talk to people on the, uh, on the Navy SEALs, I was recently on a panel with a, a naval captain who's a member of the Navy SEALs, here's what you hear. What makes us function is that we know to a person we're going to make decisions in exactly the same way as everybody else know that to our gut. So it's not a kumbaya feeling. It's not a sense of we all love each other. You may have that, but that's not what this is about. It's about the sense that we all share certain values. And because we share those values, we can do things. We can move very quickly. So when you get a group at stage four, the number here is 22%. Okay, when you get a group or tribe at stage four, here's what happens. Okay, number one, production or productivity becomes frictionless, which is so easy to move forward to get things done, just remarkably um, uh, just kind of easy, right, to get things going. Uh, some of you that may have heard Tony Shea uh, did a webinar here at Ripple not too long ago. I've spent some time at Zappos. It is really frictionless. That's not to say people don't have fights or spats or disagreements. They do, but they can resolve them. But here's the key. How do they resolve them? They go back to the values and they say, here's what the values say we should do. And the problem gets resolved really quickly. So if you don't have those shared values, then what happens? Then you fall down to stage three, and it becomes about what you think, what I think. It becomes I, 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 whoever can out-argue, 
out the bay uh, or whose credentials are better tends to win the day, or perhaps whoever's got managerial authority. Many of us have worked in those situations, and they're just unproductive. They're also not very fun. So that's stage four. Again, emergence of shared values is one of the keys. We'll look at some other keys as we continue to, um, to get into this. So uh, stage five, I'm going to put up a picture here that is clearly an older picture, given how, in this case, they're all men, how they're dressed. And of course, it's a black and white photograph. If you're not familiar with this, the, uh, what I'm about to say may surprise you. This is a picture of the Manhattan Project early people on the Manhattan Project. Now, this was the group that built the first atomic bomb. So you might be saying, but wait a minute, they built the bomb. That's not, that's not life is great. That's potentially planet destroying. Well, here's the thing. Robert Oppenheimer got this group together, the tribal leader, got together literally the smartest people in the world, okay? So here's the challenge facing him. This might be the challenge facing you. How do you get the smartest people in the world and get them to function together as a team. So imagine Einstein is writing in letters, which he did. The FBI actually wouldn't let Einstein join the Manhattan Project. They thought he might be a communist. So he'd write in letters sometimes, critiquing their progress because he heard about it. So imagine you're in a team meeting and you get a letter from Einstein, right? That's fairly destructive of uh, organizational dynamics, right? Well, here's what makes stage five function. Number one, there's no them. If I go back just for a second to our picture of USC, I have no idea who USC was playing here. It could have been our crosstown rival, which is UCLA, or it could have been Stanford. But clearly, we just won, right? We scored. We're great. They suck. So in stage four, there has to be a rival. So at stage five, there is no rival. But you say, wait a minute. They were trying to build the bomb ahead of the Nazis. Well, right. But if you actually look back at what people were saying, Here's what the actual transcripts reveal. The goal was to unlock nuclear power, to make atomic power available to the world. Now, also, there was the sense that we want to make sure that the world survives, that the view was, especially among people who were of Jewish descent and had fled Nazi Germany, that if the Nazi regime got the bomb first, it would be world-ending, right? So survival of the planet, there's really no them inherent in that. Uh, unlocking atomic power, there's no them in that. This occurs, stage five occurs only 2% of the time, only 2% of the time. And these are the groups that go on to change the world. So in technology, we've done a lot of research in organizations, and I'm thinking of some famous brands, and if you're thinking of famous brands, we're probably thinking of the same ones, that have gone on to change the world, that have reinvented how people communicate with various types of media, or how they communicate with other people right, through these world-changing innovations. Xerox Park is one of the more famous examples from years ago. A group at Xerox Park developed is too strong where they built upon some early discoveries and produced the first working graphic user interface that most of us have right now in front of us. I have five of them in front of me. You probably do, too. So that's stage five. There's no them. The goal was not to get the graphic user interface ahead of IBM. It wasn't about beating IBM, it was about doing something historic, industry changing, that kind of innovation. Again, this is only the case about 2% of the time. Okay, so this is the end of the first part, and I've been watching the questions, and it looks like we don't have any questions yet. If you do have any questions, please uh, send them through the Q&A, and I'll, uh, I'll take them as they come, or perhaps even stop if we get a number. Otherwise, we're going to go on to now the second half. Okay, so let me explain where we are. So we've gone through the, what a tribe is. Remember, a tribe is 20 to 150 people. Remember, it's the strength of your tribe that determines performance. The only reason we're having this discussion is we want to build tribes that can do really great things. The goal of this is to get your tribes to stage four. Now, you might say, well, why not stage five? And stage five is industry changing. Well, at stage four, you're really grounded, right, in a sense of reality, a sense of how things work, a sense of where you stand next to your competitors. But at stage five, there is the tendency to drift up into the ether a bit. So we studied some groups during the dot-com uh, bubble in 99 and 2000 that would say, when we'd go in and say, who's your competitor? And they'd say, oh, no, that's, that's old thinking. No, you got to look at the new thinking. It's not about, it's not about money. It's not about cash. It's about eyeballs. Well, okay, so who's your competitor? Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's retailing. Our competitors Detailing. Notice that there's a little bit of stage five to that. You can probably hear the eyes glazing over a little bit. 
So that's all good. Problem was they hadn't made things work yet at stage four, so they weren't ready to go on to stage five. You got stuff working at stage four, you know who your competitors are, you got that iron out, you're focusing on strategies that are going to directly compete and win in the marketplace, and also you can take these occasional leaps into stage five and produce innovations that go on to do really, really great things. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the anatomy of a triad. So what's this? So if you think back to stage four, okay, remember stage four is the emergence of shared value. And I said we're going to get to another component of stage four in the second half. Here it is. The basic building block of stage four tribes is not two people, but three people. So how does that work? Well, if you go down the hallways of the best performing organizations that I've ever seen, what you see is three people just naturally blocking down the hall together. And if somebody else happens to see them, they might join a little group of three. Remember, it's the, it's the minimum number, it's not the maximum number. So you'll see groups of three walking down the hallway together. They pick up somebody else, they pick up someone else, the group goes off to Starbucks. If it's one of these high tech organizations that has things like volleyball courts and uh, fun stuff to do outside, they might do that together and then they go back to work. Of course, they start early and they often go late, but they just they naturally group, they cluster into these groups of three. If you go into, say, a law firm or you go into an academic environment, you go into a sales culture, here's almost always what you see. One person talking to another person. So it's one-on-one. -on -one. It's a two-person relationship. It, now, it might be me talking on the phone through a Bluetooth, but clearly whoever I'm talking to is more important than you. And you kind of get that sense. Think of a hospital if you were in one recently. Hopefully you won't be. But next time you're in one, just look around. I mean, I'm talking about the people work there. You will see individuals alone, people walking in groups of two, rarely in groups of three. So a triad is three people that have two characteristics. Characteristic number one is they all share the same values. Okay, remember, we're talking about the, the SWAT team here. We're talking about the Navy SEALs. We're talking about elements of Zappos. They know what values unite them. That's the first characteristic. The second characteristic is they're working on a project or an initiative of some kind. If you're familiar with the uh, work uh, done in, in the Agile world or, or Scrum methodologies, you're probably familiar with some of these. I'm not saying those are the necessarily the methods that people use, but they tend to engage in very short term, say 90 days or less, uh, what we call micro strategy, and they're working on that together. So they've got their values and they're applying it in a very specific specific short-term way that is going to net out some very important gain for the tribe, for the organization, or for the people that they serve. Now, if you just kind of hang on to the triad, we're going to see why that becomes really important, okay? For one thing, they grow exponentially, okay? So three people, notice across the bottom there, you got three people, they can form one triad, okay? Four people can form, well, you can see how that works, four people can form four triads, ten people can form 120 triads, and I wasn't sure how many were going to be on the call. My guess was about 100. I think we've got a bit more than that. But 100 people could form 161,700 triads. Now, you might be saying, well, okay, but who cares? Well, here's why that's important. Because if you get six stable triads, something remarkable will happen. So my uh, business partner, John King, one of the co-authors of Tribal Leadership, uh, one thing was the first to identify the triad and also began to notice this phenomenon that when we would go into organizations, we would create six triads that were stable, meaning that they're going to endure past right a few days or actually working on a project, and as soon as those disappear, new triads form. You tend to have triads that persist over time. Something magic happens. Now, this is, of course, a picture of the early days of Microsoft. You can see a little Bill Gates there, and if you know some of the other people at Microsoft, you can pick them out. So why am I showing this to you? Well, in Gates' own writings and the writings of other people at Microsoft, two things were really important. One, this is a direct quote from Gates, it was the 100 core people at Microsoft that made us successful. But what about the 100 people that made us successful? It was the relationships between them. So the thing about a triad, so if we've got Zach and George and me, and we're part of a triad, okay, here's what happens. Let's say that I'm having a bad day, that I had a flat tire on my way to work, and I'm just generally pissed off. Whose problem is that? If, if, if George, Zach, and I have a triadic relationship. Well, it's George's problem and it's Zach's problem. So it's their job to rebuild 
the relationship between the whole triad, the relationship that, that is on the opposite side of the triangle. So again, it's Zach's job to rebuild George uh, and Dave's relationship. So the way that, that we often express this in tribal leadership lingo is you need someone to have the back of your relationship. The same way you want your coworkers, you want your colleagues, you want your partners to have your back, you want people to have the back of your relationships, okay? And we're talking about relationships to work, just a quick little side note, it happens in the romantic world too, okay? If you, if you and your significant other have no support in your social world, then let me know, because I want to bet against that relationship. The minute you have a spat, you're going to go talk to your friends, and he or she will go talk to their friends, and what will the friends say? Oh, we knew this was going to happen, you can do so much better, right? And it breaks up the relationship. Now apply that metaphor to organizations, and that's what you see in space and organizations. People have a spat, they have a fight, they disagree over something, and they go and they collude with each other. So notice how this creates stage three, little bits of stage two around it. So if you build triads in your organization, they become remarkably resilient. In a two-dimensional world, a triangle can handle much more stress than can a line, right? A line is a dyadic, two-person relationship. A uh, triangle is, of course, a triadic. Uh, relationship. Uh, okay, so I see we've got some questions coming in. Let me just do a quick little sprint here to the end of the, of the section and then I think we can handle any questions. Uh, so first of all, this is just a slide that summarizes how you actually change tribes. Okay, in other words, how do you get a tribe to change? So at one, you want to get a new tribe. Remember, these are criminal tribes. They might cook the books. They might do bad stuff. Now, if you've got a stage two tribe, okay, remember I've mentioned find the one person. So what do you do with the one person? Well, a couple big takeaways, okay? These takeaways apply to all of the levels, okay? So takeaway number one, a tribe only moves one stage at a time. So if you've got stage two, you want to take them to three. They can't go to four, it's too much, but they can go to three. So how do you do that? Well, you find an individual, okay, who's talking stage two, they're the ringleader, maybe they want things to be different, and you pull them offline. And here's the second takeaway. People and groups can only hear one level or stage above and below where they are. So if you've got a person at stage two, they can't hear stage four. Don't talk about shared values. They can't hear it. So what do you do? You talk from the perspective of stage three. Well, what do you say? I think you have the real potential to be great. I think you can make a real difference. Now, what's the success indicator you're looking for? That person says, wow, you're right. They look around at their tribal members and they say, these guys suck. I'm great. And they kind of put their hands up in a sort of Charlie Sheen winning gesture, right? So that person has now moved up to stage three. Are you done? No. You didn't say, so you're, you're great, right? You're getting great results. Yeah, man, get out of the park. Okay, can you do for, find somebody else in the tribe that's maybe another ring leader who might want things to be different. Can you do for that person what I did for you? They'll look at that person and say, but, but, but they suck. Well, I know, but can you make them suck less, right? And so then you mentor, that person mentors this other person in the tribe. Notice what's happening is you're approaching the tribal problem one person at a time using mentoring from stage three language. That's how you change that entrenched mediocrity. You don't send them to team building. You don't have them climb ropes. You don't have them fall back and have each other catch them and then talk about how much you trust each other. Don't do any of that stuff. You, you network with them one person at a time. And when you do that, wait for the success indicator, which is, wow, I'm great. You know, uh, okay, now can you do for another what I did for you? Now, what do you do if you've got groups at step three? Remember, this is sales, this is academia. Well, here are really simple questions to ask. Just sit down with people one-on-one, -on -one, or you can do it in a group. And ask questions like, why did you join this company? They got to approach it with a sense of curiosity, not with a sense of uh, the hammer's about to fall. So you're not cross-examining a hostile witness here. You're just asking a question. So why did you decide to join this organization? Why did you decide to go into this line of work? Why did you decide to go into sales? Why did you decide to go into high-tech or biotech or whatever it is? And just listen and ask open-ended questions. And what will happen? Like a rose opening in front of you, uh, they'll reveal their deepest commitment in life. They'll do it. They actually want to talk about it. For most people, we're desperate to talk about it. We never have the chance because everybody's blathering on about themselves. So you just approach people either one-on-one -on -one or you can do it in a group and ask questions like that. And let's just get to know each other a little 
better. Tell me, why did you decide to go into this line of work? Or someone comes up to you at the end of the day and says, wow, I had a great day. Start asking open-ended questions. What made it so great? Oh, wow, well, I closed this one deal, but tried to do that for the last six months. Oh, that's amazing. Well, tell me, is, since we're just chatting, why is that client, getting that client on board, so rewarding to you? And what will happen as you do this across the tribe is you'll begin to notice the tribe actually shares values. They just don't know that they share values. What do you do at that point? You get everybody together and you start talking in terms of the shared values. Turns out we're all on board with the same stuff. Now, how can we cook up an initiative, a micro strategy of some kind, maybe something off the scrum methodology that could really express that value and show how remarkably cool, I'm going to quote a friend of mine in cancer research, how insanely cool we actually are. Now, will everybody get on board? No. But most of them actually will, because if you've gotten their value right, their core values trump individual ego. Now, if you've got a group of four, first of all, stabilize it more. Build triads. Make them network all over the place. Okay, make those network, make those those you know suckers just all over the place. Build six stable tribes, triads. Encourage other people to build stable triads. Then what do you do? Then you see a moment in the market and you ask the question. How can we take advantage of that? How can we do something that will be industry changing, that will be history making? So you talk without a sense of competitor, build purely on our shared values, and on that basis, you can find a way to change the world. So why don't we pause there, about 45 minutes into it, in fact, exactly 45 minutes into it, and uh, I believe we may have some questions. So should we turn to those at this point? Sure, Dave. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, we have a number of questions that actually hit on when you just talked about moving from stage to stage. The first question comes from Tracy, and her question is, if, uh, if your management, if the management of your company is at straight stage three, let's say, which is, uh, I guess, very common, how do you get them to stage four, uh, particularly if you're not the CEO, if you're not, uh, you know, their managers, how do you do it uh, as someone who reports to these managers? Yeah, that is, uh, first of all, Tracy, thank you. That is the most common question that we get, which is, uh, what if the CEO of my company or my media boss or the board or whatever, Stage three. So, uh, a couple answers. Let me start with the one that may be satisfying and then turn to maybe the one that'll keep us all up at night thinking about. The immediate answer is you want to form a stage four pocket without the involvement of the CEO. Now, I know what people are thinking, oh man, I'm going to get shot if I do that. My CEO is going to come and pound me on the head. Well, remember, they want to communicate dyadically. They'll want you to do the same. They won't want groups to get together. They'll look at it as being sloppy potentially messy, right, chaotic. They'll use phrases like, get your own ship in order. You know, I see a lot of inefficiency. I'm not really sure what you're doing over there. It kind of worries me. So you get these signals that you really don't have the full faith and confidence of your boss, okay? But why are you forming stage four? Remember, this is a performance argument. So as you begin to form stage four, a little pocket of it, it will begin to outperform the rest of the organization. At that point, most CEOs that I know, even the ones that are really kind of cynical and approach a lot of this stuff with a with a real sense of almost dread and <laughs> utter dismay, will want to know how you did it. So at the end, what stage three is really motivated by is results, right? I want to win. You're helping me to win here. Tell me what you're doing. Tell me how I can spread this. So at that point, it may grant you some space. Now the caveat here is you, Tracy, as the one who's going to build this little pocket of stage four, you've got to do one thing. You're going to get shot within probably days, if not hours. You've got to hyper-communicate with the CEO or whoever your boss is. And what I mean by that, you've got to let them know everything that's going on. Let them know what you're doing. Let them know what your successes are. Let them know what you're, what you're meeting about. Let them know that you're meeting. The, the rule is you never, ever want a person that is behaving, or in rules of stage three, to be surprised by what you're doing. That's the kiss of death. Because in surprise at stage three is a sense of, uh, I was embarrassed. I went into a meeting, Tracy, and I heard what you're doing from, you know, from somebody on the board. Do you have any idea how bad that makes me look? So you got to hyper communicate. And the success metric is you want to communicate to the point where the person will say, "Okay, I got it. I know what you're doing. Just, just, just tone it down a bit. Just let me know maybe once a week what you're doing." You actually want to communicate to the point where you, you're being a little bit of an irritation, because at that point, when they go into the meeting, and that will happen, and they get surprised, and that will happen. And they call Tracy, or they bring you in if you're not virtual, and they say, Tracy, I'm surprised. You have to be able to say, but I've been telling you for the last six months what we were doing. Remember, we had a conversation 
person will say, oh, right, right, right. Well, you need to do a better job of letting me know, because that didn't make an impression. Okay, well, I'll continue to communicate. Okay, great. Now, you want the results to quickly catch up. Okay, that's what gives you the space. Now, here's the part of it that's really dismaying. Why is that such a common question? Uh, Gary Hamill has probably got the best answer for it, which is if you look at how management actually works, that's a set of technology, that's his term, that we're in management 1.0. It was actually management that was developed by people who were born in the 19th century. It's how GM was run for a long time, right? It's one of the reasons I'm such a fan of Ripple, because a lot of uh, what they do promotes stage four management. I'm a professor of management. Okay, this is how we teach people to manage. Find your direct reports. Let's say you got six of them. And you meet with each one of them individually. You say, you know, I'm the boss. In case you haven't noticed, I'm your boss, right? You're not. I'm a boss. You're not. Tarzan logic there. I need you to do these three things. Write them down. I'm going to hold you accountable in six months or a year to how you did on them. And we'll make it a little warm and fuzzy. You, you can tell me how I'm doing it at the same time, but really I don't care. I'm just going to tell you how you did. That's going to determine your performance increase, whether you're eligible for a so the very nature of stage, sorry, the very nature of management encourages stage three. Leadership is about stage four and five. Management is about stage three, owning stage three, and it's getting people to do stuff who are largely at stage two. And that's why uh, Tracy's uh, question is not only so important, but also so common. So hopefully that answered it. George, any others? We do. We have, we have a couple questions, actually. Oh, cool. we, uh, I have another, another couple questions from Rochelle and Diane. And how do, you, how do you implement these strategies when you have virtual teams split amongst multiple locations? Okay, uh, two answers for that. One is you can do exactly the process that we've been talking about here virtually. Uh, you just do it over telephones, you do it over Skype, you might do it over video conferencing. It's a little harder. The nature of virtual relationships encourages information transmission, not just, or rather not the kind of deeper um, sort of open-ended questions. Uh, so one way is you just have to kind of make time for it. So you might, for example, if you got a call set up, you know, phone the person 10 minutes earlier and say, you know, I just wanted to chat with you for a few minutes because I would really, would really like to get to know you a little better. Here's the second way you can do it. Most virtual teams will get together on occasion. Uh, there's one very small company that I've done a bit of work with. Um, got an MBA, so I won't say a lot about it, but they're the software business. They're located in the Midwest. And they have two meetings every year. One of the meetings is their own uh, their own employees, they get together. And so what they've begun doing in those sessions is to do two things. Number one, doing a deep dive on their values to identify them, and secondly, to turn those values, to convert those strategies, I'm sorry, to convert those values into strategy uh, decisions. So what do we stand for as a company? How do we actually turn those into a strategy? How do we implement a strategy based on them? The second meeting that they have every year is with their users, remember they're in the software business, so a number of years ago, those user, user meetings were just dull, right? They were uh, sessions where they were they trained people on how to use the latest, latest version of their software. They got to know the customers according to their values. One of the things that the customers really liked was the social aspect of getting together with people in, in the industry. This is a software company that focuses on one particular uh, niche. People really wanted to network within that industry. So they turned these user groups into the most outlandish, like three-day, uh, since I'm not mentioning the name of the company, drunken parties you've ever seen. And when they started doing that, the number of customers just spiked because the customers would then recruit other people to be customers of the company so they could come to party during the user group. So everybody won, right? The customers win, the company wins. So short answer is you want to convert those in-person uh, meetings, even if they're once or twice a year, into times when you're really focusing on values and then the expression of values. Great. Thanks, Dave. Um, just one more question before we, I guess, get back to the, uh, the remainder of the presentation. Yeah. Actually, a question about the, the SEAL. Um, yeah. um, Dennis asked that the SEAL, attrition in the SEAL training program is actually is really high. It's, almost like, it's over 75%, I think. Uh, and, you know, these people choose to leave the tribes. Do you, do you see or have you seen a lot of attrition when people move from, uh, when tribes move from a stage three to four or four to five stage? Uh, yeah, there's definitely attrition, and it's different from each one of the moves. So let's talk about the three big moves. From two to three, uh, the people who say, I don't want to, you can't make me, this is crap, this isn't going to work, seen this before, those people will tend to uh, either be fired or opt out. It, usually it's a combination. Um, a friend of mine, actually a very famous uh, gastroenterologist, has a little plaque hanging in his, his office, not in an office where he's 
presentation of Thomas Marcy's colleagues, and the little plaque says the first clean kill awakens the entire herd. That tends to be the attrition from two to three. It's the individuals that move out, and when you have the first clean kill, everybody kind of wakes up and says, wow, it's a new day. The transition from three to four, the people who tend to move out are the people who are very rugged individualists, and they're absolutely Right? you got to do it my way. I'm the determinant of whether this works. I'm the person who gets the vote. They say, I'm going to cancel your vote. Uh, and everybody knows that they're good at hitting results, but they're not good at hitting it according to the values of the group. Uh, but those people tend to move out. That's actually the trickiest because, again, they're really solid producers. They're just not going to be part of a really great uh, organizational tribe or, or part of a great tribe, what we call the genius tribe. And then, remember, you want to stabilize yourself at four occasionally into five, drop back to four, get back to business, move up to five, do something that really produces remarkable innovation or insight of some kind of the drop down. But the people who tend to not be able to make that move are the ones that just want to win, but they want to win as a group. So it's not really that you want to lose those folks. You just kind of want to say, look, we're going to focus on something. We'll be right back to you and then do the move to five. When you come back, they'll be there ready, anxious to turn whatever it is you came up with into a new product or some new way to dominate the uh, we have about five minutes left. Do you want to uh, go through the rest of the presentation? Yeah, I'll tell you what. Let me just jump to uh, one very specific thing here. So I'm just going to uh, rock it ahead here. So what I'm going through is how people structure their relationships, which will be a review because we've talked about a lot of this. If you look at this slide right here, this is an actual little tribe, okay? So what do you see right here? Here's a person like little Donald Trump saying, I'm great, you're not, you're not, you're not, right? I'm great, I'm great right here, and then I'm great. So you see people haven't spoken. Those are the people who are largely exhibiting I'm great and you're not. The people who are social isolates are either stage one or stage two. You also see little clusters almost like grapes. You see little kind of emergence points of stage four, okay? So that's how you want to think about your tribe, that in your tribe you've got people that are really doing the stage three thing, even though maybe it's the dominant stage four. So you want to approach individuals wherever they are, but your goal is to take the dominant culture and elevate that one notch. So here's the same tribe a month later. This was basically people implementing triading. And you notice the same group now really looks differently, or looks different. The red lines are now uh, these new relationships that have been formed. So before you had these very competitive little silos that were great and the silo over there sucks. It's a little harder to say that when you're actually you know, connected to people, right? And so actually just uh, leave this one up. We've got a a partner in Shanghai group called the Rea Group that is doing some really great work on um, being able to do some very, very quick, like two, three minute uh, assessments per person and then to compile all of the results into what we call a cultural x ray. And it looks like this. So here's the only reason that I'm showing this to you is uh, you really want to think in detail about your group, right, and about the tribes that you have and, you know, what people uh, look like, how they structure their relationships. There are in depth ways to measure that. You can just do it the good old fashioned way of going in and using your ears, noticing what types of discussions that you have. So that's a little bit on that. So now let's drop to the very, very last thing. I told you we got something exciting coming up. So here it is. Uh, tribal leadership is coming out in uh, paperback in just a few days. It actually hits stores on June uh, 7th. So we've got a pre order process up through June 2nd. It absolutely expires June 2nd. Okay. So this is just a chance for you to get the paperback. We're actually, um, we're actually selling it below our cost. But if you go on the web page this year, which is uh, triballeadership.net, uh, and click on limited time offer, what I would really suggest you do is scroll down to something called a 10 pack. Okay? So it's obviously a, a 10 pack of books. It'll cost $160. But we've never done this before. We'll never do it again. We're offering our full training library for that. You get a series called uh, Business Genius, which people have described as absolutely life changing. It's not what you think. It's not saying you got a little genius living inside. You go find that person and you know, make friends with them. It's not it at all. It's a completely different approach. It'll sort of mess with your way of, uh, of seeing the world. Uh, if you happen to know Evan Pagan and his work, he's tied in about $1,000 of uh, products for free as part of a 10 pack. And then, you know, why are we doing a 10 pack? Well, it's very much our hope that you will use, of course, you get one copy for yourself, that you'll take those other nine copies. Think about that. That's now three potential triads. And you'll give the books to other people, maybe highlight a section that you'll want them to read, see if you can get them on board with one of these discussions 
about where's our tribe, right? Where's our company tribes? Where do we want them to go? Just engaging them in that discussion. And I know we're just about out of time here, but I just want to tell you a really quick story. I mentioned Warren Bennis, uh, one of my mentors from USC. Uh, I, the other day I opened an envelope. It was a uh, thing from Warren. It was a book that he sent me. It wasn't a book that he wrote. It was just a book that he happened to read. And he attached a little post-it note on it. He said, David, I really thought you'd appreciate this book, especially, and he highlighted a couple chapters. Now, I dropped everything I was doing to read this book because people don't really do that, right? I mean, they give away their own books. Uh, but think, when was the last time someone just handed a book to you and said, this book really gave me a lot of insight, and I think it will do the same for you. I got a copy for you. And that is a great way to build a relationship. And again, it's our entire training library, which would normally be, I don't know, like $2,600 or something. It's like 160 bucks. Remember, it expires June 2nd. There's no way we can make it available after that for our agreement with uh, HarperCollins. We really hope you'll take advantage of it. And uh, again, get on the little tribal leadership bandwagon here, and hopefully you can upgrade your tribes and make really, really great places to work, and also places that just consistently hit it out of the park. So uh, to George, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with your group today, for everybody on the call. Uh, thank you. Hope you learned something. If you have any questions, uh, my direct email address is dlogan, D-L-G-A-N, at usc.edu. Again, dlogan at usc.edu. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time, and everyone on the call really appreciate your uh, time, attention, your questions, and from here and into the future of your partnership. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dave. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the talk, and it was everything I was hoping it would be. I took a ton of notes, so I, I probably will be emailing you soon with uh, further questions that I have. Uh, but uh, to everyone on the call, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our Ripple Leadership uh, event today with Dave Logan. We will be posting the slides and the recordings uh, shortly, probably within the next 24 hours, to our website at ripple.com slash webinar. And we will also email you uh, a link where you can download the slides and the recordings and share them uh, with the people in your tribes. So uh, that's it for today, and we will uh, look forward to seeing you guys on our next leadership series. Thanks all. Take care.